Thanks everyone who's made time today to join us. Looks like we have 100 attendees. Uh, so that's all thanks to Arvind and Alok who have uh, so kindly uh, given us their time this afternoon um, to be our speakers. So you've, you've brought in a fantastic audience. Thank you both. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time uh, right now because our, um, Alok actually has to leave very quickly and I want to make the most of the time that he has to give us. I'm going to just introduce um, the speakers, for those who do not know, and there will be very few among us, Dr. Shivastav is a professor of medicine and department of um, hematology, um, the head uh, of the Center of Stem Cell Research, which is a unit of InSTEM at the Bangalore Life Science uh, Cluster. He is um, at the Christian Medical College, CMC Velour. Uh, I would also mention that uh, Alok is the co-chair of the Scientific and Technical Appraisal Group at uh, the DVT, uh, the Government of India, and he has, he has many, many feathers in his cap. And I think if I were to go on about everything that Alok is and everything that he does, we will uh, eat into at least 20 minutes of our time. Um, our, our second speaker is Dr. Arvind Ramanathan, who is a faculty here at INSTEM, part of the Bangalore Life Science Cluster. And Arvind works on metabolic regulation of tissue uh, homeostasis during injury, environmental stress, and aging, from basic biology to translation. And for those who did not know, he's also an excellent cartoonist. Um, and he's working on a graphic novel on aging, which he's illustrating himself. So I'm, I'm terribly excited, like beside myself with excitement. Uh, and I'm very keen to listen to both of these speakers. So without any further ado, Alok, this is your show, take it away. And um, I would ask everyone to please hold on to your questions till the end of Alok's talk, uh, just so we can get the most of uh, the time we have with him. Uh, Alok, you will have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayan. I'm trying to share my screen and uh, please let me know if you are able to uh, share. Yeah, okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. So good evening, everyone. Uh, what I was asked to talk about today is gene therapy and what does it mean? Uh, this is because, you know, our group at the Center for Stem Cell Research has been working in this area for several years now. And some of these have advanced to a point where it might actually make a difference in the community. And we, so we thought it's a good thing to, to talk about. So um, I'm sure most people on this uh, on the discussion today are aware that uh, you know we we live because we have many genes that make proteins that are important for life. And so maybe about uh, 30 years ago, uh, scientists and physicians around the world decided that we should understand our entire genome. And so this big project that I'm sure you're aware of called the Human Genome Project was initiated. And as you can see, it took, uh, they had planned to finish this by 2005. So they thought it will take 25 years to actually sequence the human genome. But, uh, you know, they finished two years uh, earlier. So in 2003, the human genome was actually mapped out. And what we realized is that uh, most of us are very similar to one another while we might look different, talk different, eat different, whatever. So um, the important thing there is that after understanding the human genome, one could understand diseases better. Yeah, even though the promise of human genome, genome towards therapies did not really materialize the way one would have wanted it to, but it certainly enhanced our understanding of human diseases significantly. And one of the things that we need to understand before we get into gene therapy is that when there is a change in the DNA sequence to a point where it affects the normal function of that gene, then it's called a mutation. And these mutations become the basis for many hereditary diseases. So what then is the principle of gene therapy? So as I said, if you have a defective gene, then you need to either replace it or correct it. In the past, we only talked about replacement. Now we can talk about correction. So you can artificially create a gene, a transgene, and I'll come back to that. But then you need to somehow get it into the body. It has to reach the target cell. And for this, it needs a vehicle, which we call a vector. 
we'll come back to this. And then you can inject it through different roads into the person, or you can actually treat the cell from the person outside the body, and then put that cell back as a transplantation. So by whatever means, you do need to get this vector with the transgene to the target cell. Then this vector makes an entry into the cell and it can do two things. It can remain outside the nucleus, or it can remain outside uh, the chromosome, or it can integrate with the chromosome, the genes. So, it, so we have a non-integrating vector, which then re releases the transgene, which will express itself, what we call episomally without integrating into the genome, or it will integrate into the genome and then express itself. And, and then what happens is that you actually uh, see the proteins coming out of this cell. So you need to carefully select the cell that will accept the transgene, allow it to function, generate the protein that you're interested in, and release it for function in the body. So you can do this in two ways. As you can see on this slide, it can be what we call a direct delivery, where the vector itself is injected nowadays most often intravenously, but in certain diseases, uh, you may have to inject it near the target, like in various muscular disorders, uh, you know, people were injecting into the muscle. You may also inject it intravenously, hoping that it will reach the muscles, uh, you know, so that's another approach. On the so that's what's shown on the left. On the right, what you see is something that started almost 20, 25 years ago. And there you take out the cells from the person, usually a stem cell, the most easily accessible stem cell is the blood stem cell or the hematopoietic stem cell. You take that out, you insert the gene ex vivo into this. So you genetically modify this cell in a way inserting the normal copy of the gene that you're interested in. And then you transplant these stem cells back into the patient so that now the patient gets back his own stem cell, but with a normal copy of the gene. So that's how essentially gene therapy is done. So now the question of the, the carrier vehicle, the, the delivery system. So I said you need to make the transgene. So it kind of mimics a, a very simplified version of a gene where you have a five dash and a three dash. And it's important that you choose a suitable promoter and then have the expression uh, sequence, which is the transgene that you created. This then needs to be carried by vectors. So vectors can be either a viral vector, which is what is more commonly used. And you know, those usually, are, you know, the ones that are commonly in clinical use at the moment have been listed below, the adenovirus, uh, the, the adeno-associated virus, the lentivirus, and retrovirus. Now, those of you who are familiar with diseases can imagine that some of these are very dangerous viruses causing very serious human disease, uh, including something like HIV infection. So how can we use such, uh, such viruses as vectors? Well, these are recombinant viruses. They're completely gutted. And so what you uh, have is just the capsid of these viruses, so they don't replicate at all. So these are non-infectious. They are just being used. They're, they're the, um, their property to uh, infect cells is being utilized to transfer the transgene. So that's really what uh, these, you know, these viral vectors are. Now, there are also possibility of using non-viral vectors of which there are many types. The most commonly used one is either the, the plasmid directly, but that's rather inefficient. And therefore the plasmid is then packaged into a liposome and the liposome can be made uh, you know, specific for different cells, depending on what receptors they, they, they target. And so this is becoming uh, a more uh, often used uh, vector for gene therapy as well. So, Finally, between the transgene and the vector, you can do two things. You're either adding a gene, gene addition, where you are replacing a normal copy, uh, most often, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, essentially making the abnormal dysfunctional gene uh, irrelevant. Or nowadays, uh, we can do what's called gene editing. So what do we mean by gene editing? So in a way, it's like molecular cut and paste. So as I, as I mentioned before, a mutation is a change in the sequence that does not allow that gene to function. So if you could just cut out the sequence that was disrupting gene function and replace it with a normal sequence, then that gene could start functioning again. 
So this is now possible using various, uh, you know, naturally occurring uh, enzymes, which are called endonucleases. And these have the capacity to disrupt the DNA and then insert known sequences that you are interested in. So the most uh, common of this now is the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which I'm sure you've probably seen in, in magazines uh, being talked about. There are at least two others that uh, can be used. Uh, the other one that is in clinical use is the zinc finger uh, protein uh, that uh, can also be used uh, in a transcription factor. So you can now edit the gene so that you remove the abnormal sequence and you bring in the normal sequence. And then you can have the gene function again. So what kind of diseases do we target for gene therapy? So we can broadly consider them in two categories. Uh, first, a large number of hereditary disorders and a disorder where a single gene defect is clearly identified. As you can imagine from what I've said before, theoretically, any single gene de defect disorder could be treated with gene therapy because then you could provide a normal copy of the gene and make it function in a suitable cell. So the common diseases where this has been applied right from the late 1980s, 1990s is immune deficiency disorders and the most severe among them, the severe combined immune deficiency. Now there is a whole host of other immune deficiency disorders for which we have gene therapy available. Uh, the next major group is a large number of people in the world. In fact, the, the commonest monogenic disorder in the world are related to hemoglobin disruptions. And so we have thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And so these are other targets. And in fact, now we even have a product for both the first two indications. And then more, uh, you know, we've uh, got a whole lot of people with genetic bleeding disorders, among which hemophilia is one of the most severe ones. And so a lot of work has gone towards hemophilia and there are advanced stage clinical trials going on and products are likely to be available soon. Then a, a lot of children are affected by muscle and neurological disorders. And this is again, a major area of research. And we also have products available for some of these and many more are in the pipeline. Now, gene therapy need not be limited to only hereditary genetic disorders. Uh, they can also be used for acquired disorders. Two large groups there, you know, cancers, uh, where we use gene-modified immune therapy cells. And I'll just touch upon that at the end. And then, of course, various degenerative disorders uh, like Parkinson's disease and many others where gene therapy is also being attempted. So I thought I'll just give you a snapshot of how the AAV vector has been used in hemophilia to show a timeline of how much work has gone on for how many years. So the AAV genome was cloned uh, you know, sometime in the 1980s and it took almost 20 years. You know, uh, science was not uh, maybe as effective and efficient as it is today. Uh, so it took a long time before people could actually purify that and scale it up to make enough AV, uh, you know, vector in, in teeters that could then be used for doing gene therapy. So actually in the late 1990s, uh, mid to late 1990s, almost five gene therapy trials using AV vector were initiated, they all failed, uh, people did not understand the immune responses, and that led to a, almost a 10 year delay uh, in, in the next phase of gene therapy, which uh, for hemophilia, which happened then by 2011, when the first successful gene therapy was reported, and then a follow up paper from the same group based out of University College uh, uh, Research Center in Memphis, USA. These, uh, these two then had a follow up paper in 2014, but that then opened the floodgates. Because now people understood the formula. Then we've got a whole you know, trials going on uh, for gene done. People So broadly, what does the scientist and the physician have to do? Well, you first need to understand what you're trying to treat. You understand you test the system, you need to take it to
Uh, excuse us. I think there is a technical problem. With... I I am I still audible? Uh... Yes, you are audible now. Uh -huh. The last two three okay. minutes of your talk was not so. Uh, if you could just uh, go back a couple of minutes. Go back. Was this slide? Was this the slide on which it was not? We'll have to share your clear? screen again. Okay, I need to share my screen again. Okay. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So I was just uh, saying that this uh, screen was meant to give a, a, a snapshot of uh, how gene therapy has evolved and took almost 40 years, uh, well, 30 years to get the first successful gene therapy for hemophilia from the time people started trying. But once we got the first successful one in 2014, in the last five years, the number of gene therapy trials for hemophilia have exponentially increased. And now people understand how to do gene therapy very much, uh, you know, much, much more. And the same applies for hemoglobin disorders, the immune deficiency disorders, the muscle and neurological disorders. And what I was trying to convey from this slide is that it takes a fair bit of work first on the basic research of trying to understand the disease and the gene function and how it can be uh, corrected. Uh, and then the preclinical models where you start testing in the animal and then, of course, a very important aspect is the production of a vector, because without that, there is no therapy. And that's a major limitation in our country uh, that needs to be addressed. But once that happens, then we take it through the phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And, you know, sometimes somewhere around phase two and three, if there is enough clinical need, it may actually get uh, you know, authorization for clinical use, or it then has to complete the phase three and then get authorization for clinical use. But being new therapies as they are, all these patients require very close follow-up because we don't know, and there can be potential side effects, uh, include, including, uh, you know, carcinogenesis, and therefore one needs to follow them up for a long time, somewhere between five and 15 years, depending on the kind of vector that has been used. So uh, for successful gene therapy, you need technology, you need the preclinical models, you need the clinical grade vector production. You then need regulatory processes in the country because if the regulators in the country don't understand how to evaluate and uh, approve gene therapy clinical trials, then you can do everything you want, but you will never get the approval. And this has happened uh, in the past. Uh, and then of course, depending on the results of failure or success of the trial, you then have to take it to a scaled up process where you can then treat hundreds and thousands of people um, uh, with those diseases in the world. So, you know, there are already several gene therapy products that are approved uh, in the last uh, three to four years. Uh, there is a product for thalassemia. There's a product for immune deficiency. There are two products for uh, treating cancer, uh, certain types of hematological cancer. Uh, those are the CAR T cells. And then we have a product for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a neurological disorder where the, you, know, you have a muscle problem. And then we have uh, uh, gene therapy for uh, a blindness disorder, which is, which is genetic. The problem from our point of view is that uh, these are the kind of costs we are talking about. So those, the M there stands for million. So you are looking at one to 1.5 million euros or 0.5 to $2 million for each dose. So, you know, uh, that's not really realistic. And, you know, that's another discussion altogether, but it requires that we do something else uh, for ourselves here. And the Department of Biotechnology from the Ministry of Science and Technology in the government of India has been very proactive and been supporting uh, our efforts at gene therapy for several years now. And I want to very quickly just pass you through some of the work that's going on. Uh, my colleagues will be doing more such Science Cafe presentations where you will hear details of some of these uh, work that they are doing, but I'll just give you an overview very quickly. So uh, we have a collaboration and the Institute of Florida to develop AV-based gene therapy for hemophilia B. This should have been in clinical trial by last year. Uh, the challenge we had was the collaborator who was supposed to produce this in the US, even they had some problems producing it, even though they have filed almost 10 INDs for, uh, you know, every
Um, Alok, uh, your net, uh, your connection is uh, going again. So I'm just requesting everyone, just uh, please uh, uh, wait a minute uh, while uh, Dr. Alok comes back online. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So again, it, it looks like there was a problem with the connection again. So this is not good. But uh, anyway, let me share my screen again. And so Chandrakant, where did you lose me? Uh, just the last slide. Uh, where this one? Uh, the viewer, uh, the credit slide, I think. Yes. Okay, that one. Okay, fine. Um, Okay, so let me see if I can take it back. Yeah, so this is where, this is where I was. Uh, yeah. I was saying that, you know, vector production is a challenge. Uh, this particular AV vector production failed even in uh, one of the most experienced sites in the US. Uh, so it took us a while to get this sorted out, but it is very likely that we will be initiating this vector production in India itself later this year. And if that goes successfully, then we should be able to initiate the clinical trial sometime next year. But, uh, and, and this was just showing the design of the transgene. The one on top is the one that was uh, used in the first successful gene therapy trial. We have made a similar one with significant modifications, tested it in the mouse model uh, and showed that there is enough expression of the protein. And this particular one then also had to be tested in what's called a humanized liver mouse where 30 to 70% of the mouse liver hepatocytes are of human origin. And this again showed enough expression of the protein. Based on this, we are, are proposing the clinical trial once we have the GMT grade vector produced. The other one we are working on is a lentiviral based gene therapy for hemophilia A. So here there's factor VIII deficiency and here we're inserting the transgene into the hematopoietic stem cell, uh, which then has a particular promoter that will help it produce in certain subsets of the differentiated cells. So, you know, this is the cartoon showing the, the construct of this transgene, which uh, then will be uh, placed in a lentiviral vector. We will take the stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells of the recipient, we transduce it ex vivo, and that product then gets uh, infused intravenously after the patient has been prepared to accept this stem cell transplantation. So this actually is very similar to what is done for hemoglobin disorders. So that brings me to the discussion on what we are doing for hemoglobin disorders, which is a huge public health problem in our country. Here again, you have uh, at least two options. The one which has been tried so far more extensively is the lentiviral based uh, gene therapy where you take uh, stem cells from a recipient, you purify it, you then treat it with the viral vector, use it back very similar to what I just showed for hemophilia, but this has been done for much longer. In hemophilia, it will be the first in human. On the other hand, now there's also a gene editing approach uh, where you can modify certain genes to make uh, to increase hemoglobin production. And this is also in clinical trials now. Both these are being done at the Center for Stem Cell Research. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Arvi Shaji, Dr. Mohan Murugesan, and Dr. Saruna Bhavan are working on these areas and they will be making presentations in, in, in future editions of the Science Cafe. So I want to finish by just mentioning that another exciting area of uh, gene modified cell therapy is what's called immune cell therapies. So you know that many cancers are untreatable because they become resistant to the chemotherapy. And so one way to treat those cancers is to actually use our own immune cells, modify them with special, uh, does the, I mean, special, um, chimeric uh, receptors which then make them behave in a way that they can go and attack the, the, the cancer cells and, and destroy those cells. So this approach is now becoming quite extensive. In fact, uh, there are already two products licensed uh, for this therapy 
And I have to say that, uh, you know, one of the countries that has really gone ahead in a major way in this area is China. The number of centers offering CAR T cell therapy for all kinds of malignancies in China is even more than what uh, is happening in the US. So here what you do is you take the cells from the, from, from the patient, you, uh, you isolate the T cells, you then introduce the chimeric antigen receptor, uh, and then you expand that T cell and you infuse it back uh, to, to the patient. Now, there is a lot of design for different generations of these CAR T cells and you know, it increases their effectiveness, it reduces their toxicity, uh, but this is amazing therapy for, for cancer that uh, uh, we need to develop in our country. Uh, some work is going on in two or three institutions, but we are not yet anywhere close to a clinical application, unfortunately, uh, with a homegrown CAR T cell. So I want to finish with just mentioning a very important work that another scientist at the Center for Stem Cell Research is doing, use, using mRNA for a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So as you must be aware that one of the earliest clinical trials for this vaccine was initiated by a company in the US that was using a liposomal uh, you know, uh, encapsulated mRNA uh, to be injected as a vaccine, which will then produce a small amount of the S protein. Uh, the, the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2, which will then act as an immunogen and in elicit an immune response and hopefully immunize the individual. So Dr. Sujan Marapalli has been working on this. Uh, he has a whole library of, of lipid uh, you know, uh, candidates, which then will be used to encapsulate the mRNA uh, for this particular uh, protein. And then you know, it will go to an animal testing. So I think you will hear about that also in one of the subsequent uh, presentations. I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry that there were interruptions because of the technical issues, but I certainly have several minutes to discuss with you if there are any questions or comments. Thank you. Hi, Alok, thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry we had a few glitches on the way. We do have a whole bunch of questions. Um, we're gonna get through them as soon as we can because I know that you need to leave. So uh, an anonymous person is asking, when the engineered stem cells are given to the humans, are they also given immunosuppressive drugs? So, you know, that's the beauty of this kind of uh, gene therapy, because, you know, we've been doing allogeneic transplantation, which means taking stem cells from other people and transplanting into human beings. And even though they are HLA matched, we need to use immunosuppression there. But when you use autologous, your own stem cells, and you modify it and give it back, no immunosuppression is required. Okay, super. Um, so Ashwini Kumar has asked a question. Uh, the question is for clinical purposes, which one is more feasible with better transfection efficiency among lipoplexes and viral vectors? So, you know, I mean, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, the, the advantage of the liposomes is that they're much easier to produce uh, much less expensive, uh, no, no great technology for uh, compared to viral vectors. Viral vectors get really uh, you know, complex in their production. They need, you need to get the right teeters. If you don't get high teeters, then the cost of production increases. So you have technological barriers and your financial barriers. But the efficiency of the viral vectors is much more than the liposomal. So you know, on one side, uh, you have the issue of less expense uh, and not as effective because not enough of the target cells get uh, transduced when we use liposomal vectors. Uh, much more get transduced when we use uh, the vital vectors. Great. I really appreciate um, the brevity with which you're answering the questions, uh, Alok. It's, it's really refreshing. Uh, we have a question from Satyanarayan, and his question is, can we control the transgene expression after transplantation? Does the gene integrate with the host genome, or will it cause any mutation? Yeah, so as I said very briefly, you know, uh, two types of expression possible. One is episomal, where it doesn't integrate at all. And so you don't use that kind of uh, therapy into cells that will divide. So if you have non-dividing cells, which you are targeting, then you leave the cells episomal uh, and they express from there. On the other hand, you, uh, you, you can use dividing cells if you are using integrating vectors so that then the transgene actually integrates into the genome. But your question is something different. Your question is whether we can control the expression. Unfortunately, no, unless you destroy the cell. 
So there are strategies being designed where you may want to later destroy the cell, but right now, none of the gene therapy programs are using that. For the moment, the effort is on trying to get enough expression. And so people are not really uh, looking at destroying. But particularly in the context of the CAR T cell, where once it has cured the cancer, you don't really want the CAR T cell to be there. We know the ones that are being, that are in the clinic now are directed against the B cell. So you do cure the B cell cancer, but then you never have B cells for the rest of your life. And that's a problem. Now you, you can treat that in other ways. Having survived the cancer, you may still have to you know, address the issue of lack of B cells. But if you could actually design a strategy where you destroy these T cells after they've done their job, that would be great. And already there are you know, strategies for that, but not yet in the clinic. Great. Uh, we have a question from Ananya. And um, the question is, is it possible to do gene therapy for a fetus that has been diagnosed with a genetic disease? So ultimately, yes, that's the, that's the goal. Because we really should not be doing medical termination because of genetic disorder, but it also depends on how early uh, that defect causes harm to the baby. So, you know, you can't really do uh, gene correction, even intrauterine, uh, till the fetus is big enough for manipulation, till the vessels are large enough for you to infuse, you know, vectors. Ultimately, that's where the science will go. But right now, not even children uh, are being included in diseases where it manifests in, in older people. So in things like hemophilia, only adults are being treated. But of course, in the immune deficiency disorders, in the spinal muscular atrophy, we are treating young children as well. But intrauterine will be happening sometime in the future, not now. Okay, um, we have a question from Ayush Srivastav who's asking, uh, could you brief the scope of gene therapy in muscle dystrophy especially in Duchenne MD? Yeah, I, I know that there are some very, uh, uh, you know, desperate patients and, uh, you know, patient advocacy organizations, their parents uh, who are really eagerly waiting for, for this to happen. Unfortunately, we do not have a successful product yet for any of the muscular dystrophies. Uh, AV-based uh, products are being tested. Uh, unfortunately, they are not even in advanced stage clinical trials. But the fact that they have worked for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a neurological disorder. It means that, you know, we should be close to getting success here, but not my field. I am afraid I can't uh, give you any more hope at this point. <clears throat> Alok, do you have time to maybe take a couple of more questions? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Shanmugam is asking, how efficient are cell therapies or gene therapies for treating Alzheimer's? So as I mentioned, this is one of the degenerative disorders which affects a large number of people, uh, I'm sure all over the world, but it's somehow more recognized in the West. And therefore people are, are looking at, you know, making modifications, but that's a tough one because, you know, the biology itself is not so clear. Again, I'm not a neurologist. Uh, uh, my, my leanings are towards blood diseases, but, uh, you know, it's a more difficult disease to treat. Parkinson's, on the other hand, is also a degenerative disorder where the biology is but much better understood. And so gene therapy or cell therapy uh, for Parkinson's is a little bit more advanced than for Alzheimer's. Okay, great. Um, Anushri Krishnamurthy is asking, um, what do you say about the status of gene therapeutic techniques for neural regeneration in India? So I'm not sure what you mean by neural regeneration. You know, we target, as I said earlier, gene therapy is, is directed at very specific gene defects. So neural regeneration is a very broad term and we don't direct gene therapy towards neural regeneration as such, you know. So people can do cell therapy there and that's uh, another difficult area because, you know, people sometimes think you can just put a cell with a neurogenic potential for regeneration and it will go and cure the disease that may be there. Doesn't happen like that. So, but gene therapy is much more specific you need to know the exact gene, the exact protein that's missing, and therefore you will direct uh, your transgene to, to that goal and put it into the right cell that will make the protein. So you need to be much more specific when you're doing gene therapy. Okay, um, one last question, Anuk. When can we expect CAR T cell therapy in India? So, you know, there are different ways to get it to India. And right now there are collaborations being established with uh, 
you know, vector manufacturers uh, who will make a few doses available to a few centers in the country. But indigenous, uh, there is a group at IIT Mumbai that is most advanced in this country. Uh, they will have major challenges producing the vector in the country because as I said, the technology for vector production, unfortunately, even though we have a very strong pharmaceutical industry, they have stayed shy of jumping into this area. Uh, you know, they should have done it like our large neighbor, uh, maybe five years ago at least, if not 10. And uh, so I, you know, we ourselves are working on that. Uh, we, we are also working on, you know, setting up manufacturing ability in this country. So I'm afraid, you know, um, the bot gene, ther the bot car T cell therapy can be available anytime if you can pay the kind of money that I showed. There are, there are mechanisms where it can be done for about a 10th of that cost. But even that is just too much for most people in the country for the public health system. So we need indigenously developed product and I don't see that happening in less than two to three years at the earliest. Thank you so much for that, Alok. I know that you've stayed uh, on beyond the time that you said you had to leave. And I'm really grateful for that. And this was a fantastic talk. Thanks so much for your time. And thanks to everyone who had all these great questions. There are more questions, but unfortunately, um, we're not going to be able to take them now because Alok has to leave. Um, but perhaps they can email you the questions, uh, Alok, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. OK, great. So maybe we'll just share the email address at the end of the talk. But don't go away. We uh, still have Arvind next. Thank you so much, Alok, and have a great evening. Thank, thank you. I need to join another meeting. Otherwise, I'd very much love to learn how I will age. So, Arvin, all the best <laughs> for your talk. Uh, yeah, you can look up uh, Arvin's comic book. Thank you. Yes, okay. very much. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Um, bye -bye. I now want to ask uh, Arvin to, um, to come on and, and give, uh, give your talk, Arvin. Now, this particular talk, um, we're, we're asking uh, our audience to be a lot more uh, interactive. Please feel free to, um, to put your hand up if you have a question at any point during the talk. Um, ask Arvind anything that you want to ask him. Uh, this promises to be a lot of fun. So take it away, Arvind. And thanks so much for being part of the Science Cafe. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Fine. Can see everything? Yes, all clear. Okay, great. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining this talk. Uh, we'll switch gears now to maybe something, uh, a different field, but of course, Things are always related in science. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about aging, right? I mean, I'm sure there are numerous number in the audience who are uh, not scientists. Uh, there are a number of you who are scientists who have thought about these problems, but no matter who you are at this moment, each one of us is aging. And uh, this problem of aging and mortality and uh, these sorts of questions have vexed human civilizations, humankind for a very long time. So let me just start with a simple story that all of you know. Uh, we all have heard about the story of uh, Prince Siddhartha, who, uh, you know, in the, he was in uh, Lumbini, uh, this uh, part of uh, what's uh, known as Nepal today. Uh, and uh, he had this, uh, he, he lived in the lap of luxury and uh, he essentially, curiosity got better of him and he wanted to leave his uh, city and, uh, leave his kingdom and see um, what uh, the common people in this uh, city lived like. And that's when he first confronted uh, the human condition that we are all familiar with, disease, aging, and death. And uh, as the story knows, uh, all of you know that uh, Siddhartha eventually gave up the life as he knew it, and he attained enlightenment uh, and became the Buddha. So, you know, there are numerous stories like this of people gaining enlightenment in different cities, in different civilizations, but it was always our lot to uh, suffer from these things and eventually accept them gracefully, which is a good idea. But let me just put a thought in your mind, uh, which is slowly emerging in human civilization now, that what if aging is a program that can be understood and possibly altered? Uh, this, I think, is a fairly new idea. Um, and it really gets to the depth of kind of questions that we've all been asking ourselves uh, throughout history. How do we age? Why do we age? How, how does what we eat? How does the environment, how does that affect aging? 
And of course, if we really understand this situation, the provocative thing about can it be slowed? Is it inevitable? So these are all questions that have been around us for a long time. Um, so scientists often, when we try to ask these sorts of profound questions, we often try to understand how the environment and how everything else affects us. And uh, the drawing over here, which I did, uh, is not a uh, unusual scene around where we live. There's a lot of pollution and a lot of us are exposed to this. And how do these factors affect the aging process is still an unknown. So my lab at, the, uh, at INSTEM as a part of the Blisk uh, campus uh, really tries to understand certain focused aspects of this problem, which I might or might not talk about at the end. But again, I wear, as Mahin very kindly introduced, uh, I wear another hat. I love being a cartoonist. And sometimes I think I'm a scientist who cartoons once in a while or the other way around. Um, so I'm going to try to use the two skills that I have to tell you a little story about aging, what we know, and how we should uh, attack this problem. Now, which is a profound and a very broad problem. Uh, so I'm going to focus on a few variables uh, today. So how do scientists ask a question that is so broad and so actually quite difficult? Well, we often try to uh, understand how nature solves these problems. But before that, I just wanted to tell you there are other reasons to study this problem. There are other compelling reasons to study aging. And as you can tell in this graph, uh, this is, as you can tell, the x-axis essentially has the range of ages, 15 to 25 to 34, 35 to 44, and so on up to 85 plus. And what you're seeing on the y-axis is essentially zero, a number of deaths per 100,000 human beings, one, 10, 100, so it's an essentially, and, a log curve, a log axis on the uh, over here. So which means the curve is actually exponential. And hopefully what you can see is that every disease from heart disease to cancer to of course Alzheimer's, all of these exponentially increase as you get older. So there is one way of thinking about aging is, it, is that it is actually the strongest risk factor of all, most of the diseases that we care about. So if the idea being that if we understand this aging program, then maybe if we intervene in this basic program, we might actually try to uh, address some of the basic mechanisms by which other diseases like heart disease and Alzheimer's evolve. So it really helps us to understand what aging is, how this whole program works. And if so, we might be able to uh, address the underlying process of aging and in the process uh, have longer health span. We'll get to a little more of this in the future. So, like I said, I what the great Harvard naturalist E.O. Wilson often used to say that if humanity really needs to understand itself, it needs to find its reflection in nature. None of us, no human being evolved independent of nature. And the processes that we go through also occur in nature and aging being one of them. And this drawing that I drew of a few animals here tells you that no animal really is free of this process or is it? So let's take a look at this really fascinating graph over here. Uh, I really like looking at this graph because when you start thinking about aging and lifespan, you wonder how this works in nature. Is this inevitable? What are the ranges of this? You can tell over here that a fly or a worm, they only live for you know tens of days at most. You have a mouse over here that lives maybe a few years. You have a squirrel, you have cats, you have dogs, you have hens, which live surprisingly long. Uh, you have bears that live up to 25 years or more, 25 to 30 years. You have dolphins, you have swans, which live really long. You have elephants, of course, that live easily up to 75 or 80 years old. Then you have the blue whale, which is, lives pretty long. And here are us human beings, let's say an average lifespan right now of 80, 90 years. And then here's the eagle, the bald eagle lives. People have seen in nature that they can go up to 100 years in age. There are numerous other animals, and here's the turtle. Uh, these, these huge ones can live up to 125 years. And then here is the, the, the humpback whale, which I believe. And the real age of these whales isn't known. We just know these from uh, people who have uh, found their skeletons and so on. And by carbon dating and so on, you know that these things can live up to more than 150 years. We really don't know how long they can live. And then finally, these fascinating jellyfish and uh, planarians, which uh, some of our colleagues at INSTEM study, they really don't die, they're immortal, uh, as far as we know. They keep regenerating throughout their life. 
So seeing a picture like this is really fascinating to me. And I hope you can also see how interesting this is that aging and death and mortality and so on are completely variable throughout nature. And as a matter of fact, as I showed you some of these animals that are essentially immortal, maybe even death is not inevitable. So it's really interesting to understand how these things might be regulated in nature. And through that, we might get some insights into how we age. And I'll show you some insights on that. So let's try to understand then how is it that different animals, different species live different uh, lengths of lives. So here is one graph that you can tell. Here is a, a lifespan in years. And this is the mass of the animal in kilograms. And yeah, you have a fairly linear sort of a relationship. As you get heavier, you live longer. So here is this little cartoon of this uh, big man telling his uh, smaller friend that, aha, see, uh, animal, bigger animals live longer. But it's not that simple, right? We know that there are dogs, much smaller dogs, like these uh, chihuahuas. And here you have the St. Bernard. The St. Bernard usually lives at most about eight years from what I know. And the chihuahuas live uh, anywhere from 12 to 20 years. So clearly, the certain species, like dogs, being a smaller dog is more advantageous in terms of how long you can live. So clearly, it is not that simple. And there is even more confounding aspects to how animals age and how long animals live, that there are these birds, uh, parrots. Parrots live, I've heard, uh, 40, 50 years or maybe even more uh, in, in captivity. Bats, eagles that we saw in the graph before, though they are smaller animals, they live really, really long. And just an example of scientists who have been studying this a, little, a long time, Professor Steve Ostad, who actually made these seminal discoveries that he just took two opossums. Uh, there were species that lived amongst us. And then there was another opossum species that lived secluded on an island. And these species lived much longer, saying that how you evolve in the context of predators and so on also determines your lifespan. So that's interesting. And here are some more fascinating things. I don't know how many of, see if it was a live audience, I could have asked you how many of you have heard of the naked mole rat. And then you have our common rat that we all know. Though they are still rodents, you have one rat that lives just four to five years and you have a naked mole rat that lives 30 years. And these are amazing animals. These are amazing animals and lots of uh, studies being done on them because as far as we know, they are very resistant to cancer and that could be because of certain chemicals they secrete, which we are trying to find out. Highly resilient animals, they can live up to 18 minutes, I believe, uh, without oxygen. They, live under, they under, live under the ground. They live in East Africa, that's their home. But maybe the way they evolve has really regulated how animals uh, have different lifespans and how they age. And here's the last example, which I find truly fascinating. So you think, okay, there are different animals, different species, they grew in different environments, so fine. They have different uh, lifespan. But here is an example of the honeybee. The honeybee from the same egg, the same egg, remember, it's just the same egg. They are genetically very similar. They are not different species. But the drones somehow pick one of the eggs to become the, make the queen. And this queen, while it's a larval, uh, while it's in the larval developmental stage, it gets fed this thing called royal jelly. And just by feeding this royal jelly, now from the same species, what you have is a queen bee that lives 50 months as and a drone lives just two months. So that's really amazing that you can have the same species, the same animal, and based on what environment they have during their developmental process, you can completely change their lifespan so dramatically. And here's a cartoon I made of, uh, you know, the, these queens get treated extremely well. They just sit around all day and get fed the royal jelly by all of these um, drones. So again, it's a fascinating, problem is still not clear to most of us who study this as to what actually regulates lifespan. How does this come to pass? So if we want to think about aging, then I broadly think about it as two ways of this happening. One that I think was routinely accepted and it still could be true that this is just a lifetime of accumulated damage. You have a nice new car that we're all born and many of you listening are really young and sprightly. And then as you get some gray hair and you get older, you have more, more damage, oxidative free radicals, which will come to, then eventually you age and that's where you end up. But there is an emerging idea that it's not as simple as this, given that you know these animals 
you can keep them the cleanest, nicest environment, they still have set maximum lifespan. So that it's really emerging that possibly there is also a genetic control that the, our lifespans and our aging is actually encoded in our genome. And these might not be mutually exclusive possibilities, but it's still fascinating to think about the possibility that aging and, uh, and age, aging essentially is controlled by uh, genes. So how do you study this, right? It's uh, aging by definition takes a long time and it's a very difficult process to study. If you're going to study it in animals that live five and 10 years, how do you really try to understand how these things are regulated? This is where many of you scientists in the audience and to, for non-scientists, we'll often use this, this term called model systems. And we'll try to study much simpler animals that will tell us a lot more about these basic phenomena. Um, so there's a real advantage to that in that they are also simpler. But the important thing to realize here is that we hope that fundamental processes like aging are conserved, which means that though we are all different species, we did evolve together. And if there are things that are conserved, there are basic fundamental principles that are the same, even by looking at a smaller, uh, different animal, you will still uh, be able to uncover some of these fundamental principles. So of course, as scientists, we study mice, which live up to three years. And then I'll, I'm going to show you this little cartoon of this wonderful uh, worm called the C. elegans. And then of course, many people study flies that live up to 50 days. Now, I think the C. elegans, at least in early aspects of aging biology is really the hero. It's revealed some amazing things to us. And surprisingly, many of the things that it's revealed are actually maybe even true in humans. So this animal, as you can tell, I've drawn in this uh, cartoon here, is about a millimeter long and they age. They age, they live 25, 30 days. And if you see them under the microscope, I have a number of colleagues who study this, you can actually tell as the animal ages, they start moving more slowly, they look more withered. They look, start looking a little bit like what happens to us. And um, it's a fascinating, so it's a really nice animal model to study that ages. And also the wonderful thing is it has all the uh, organs like intestines and it has a pharynx and it has a germline. Uh, it's a whole genome sequence, you just heard a lot about uh, the genome sequencing from a uh, previous speaker. Uh, so a simple animal like this has been sequenced. Its genome is well understood. But the other important aspect of it, which makes this such a nice system to study aging, is that it only has a thousand cells, you know, compared to 37 trillion cells that human beings have. So if you have a thousand cells and you can really try to understand this, we might be able to uncover some fundamental principles in aging. So what have we learned? I'm going to show you some fundamental uh, good experiment that were done with this uh, animal. Um, so throughout this talk, I think I've been trying to uh, draw some cartoons of uh, some of these famous scientists, some of these uh, scientists who made these seminal discoveries, who did these, what uh, we would call landmark experiments. So uh, Cynthia Kenyon and Tom Johnson over here did this amazing experiment. I don't, uh, I don't really understand, but I think it was mostly an accident, but uh, the, the, the accepted principle uh, until the, the early 90s was that this was a matter of accumulated damage and that aging is such a complicated process. It's going to involve hundreds of genes and it's going to be very difficult to pull this out. But they made this amazing discovery almost by accident, I think, that when they mutated one gene, this simple worm that would have aged and died at 20 or 30 days, now it doubled its lifespan. So that was a remarkable result. Uh, I think it took many years for people to really understand what this was, but it was one of these landmark experiments that told you that even a complicated phenomenon like aging could be controlled by the genome. And the, uh, the, the amazing thing is that one single gene had such a profound imp impact on lifespan as to almost doubling the lifespan of this animal now really piqued everyone's interest as to, first of all, we are realizing that Aging is controlled by our genes and uh, by the genome. And we have found a gene that uh, both of them did. Now, what does this gene do? They, of course, uh, for non-scientists here, scientists always come up with remarkable names for things. Uh, age one does make sense. Cynthia Kenyon called it DAF2. We won't go into the details of that. But there is a gene in the genome that doubles the lifespan when you mutate it. What is it? So uh, there's numerous scientists who worked on this. The, the person who actually uncovered 
the identity of this gene is Gary Rofkun at uh, Mass General Hospital in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, uh, with a lot of work, they found out that this gene that actually doubles this animal's lifespan is something called the IGF-1 receptor. The IGF-1 receptor, that really shook things up uh, when people found that there's something like IGF-1R that on mutate, uh, when mutated could actually double this worm's lifespan. So many of us would know what this is. It's like the insulin-like growth factor receptor. So most of you know what insulin is. If not, just to uh, jog your memory again, if you drink a can of Pepsi or Coke uh, and you have a lot of sugar in your system, the body needs to deal with the sugar. And what it does is uh, the pancreas secrete this uh, hormone called insulin and insulin essentially binds to re its receptors, its cognate receptors and numerous peripheral tissues like liver, fat, muscle and helps them metabolize this, uh, metabolize the sugar. And similar, very similar to insulin, there's another hormone called IGF-1, which is made by the liver, which performs similar but parallel functions. So the, the amazing thing here, which we started realizing uh, as a community of scientists, as they saw these discoveries, is that the ability of an animal or of cells to sense nutrients, to metabolize and to mobilize different uh, substrates for their energy, for their food, were fundamentally linked to lifespan. And that really set the field moving and people have found many more genes and there are many, many things that are known about this. I'm going to go through a handful of things here. But the fascinating thing I'd like to go from the IGF-1 is that you know this little animal has something like looks like our insulin-like growth factor receptor. We also have those and not just us, mice have it, dogs have it, animal, human beings of course have it. So people have wondered whether what we found in the worm could actually be true. Now, the jury is still out. People are still trying to find out how this thing works. But there are some fascinating studies coming out now that when they look at groups of human beings who live well above 100 years old and, they, uh, and compare them to human beings who don't live that long, they find that the same IGF-1, uh, the IGF-1 levels of uh, this the IGF-1 levels in the blood in, in circulation are diminished, which again seems to suggest that the way human beings handle their nutrients and how they dispose of glucose and so on might actually be intimately involved in uh, the aging process. It's, uh, there are also some fascinating things that happen with human beings. Uh, there are these five parts of the world, I think they're called the blue zones. Uh, there is Loma Linda, California, there is uh, Costa Rica, there is Sardinia in Italy, Ikaria in Greece, and Okinawa in Japan, where the average lifespan is about 100, and they live happy, healthy lives. So clearly, there are parts of this earth, parts, certain societies, certain things that they eat maybe, we're still trying to understand what those are, where human beings live long, productive lives. And we really need to understand these human beings to see what drives them to have such healthy age. Uh, so uh, before I move on, it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, if you look at in history, how human beings have been aging up until 1900s, you know, a uh, little of in the 1920s or so, all of us essentially lived 30 or 40 years. That's all. And there's a sudden dramatic increase in how long human beings live. Though it's slower in Africa and Asia, definitely very dramatic in Europe. You can see now the average lifespan in the 2000s is 90, 100s exponentially increasing. Let's hope it goes up. Now, of course, this inflection point is interesting because this was with the discovery of antibiotics, which really changed how we live. But let's hope that as we find more and more factors that, uh, uh, that might inhibit the aging process, this graph continues where it's going. So the, at the end, I just wanted to say before I move on that the real goal here right now, I mean, lifespan is very, very interesting. Um, we'll see how it's regulated and we try to increase it and so on. But the important thing here is health span, that we want to live the healthiest, most productive years of our life at the end. Because most societies spend more than 90% of their healthcare costs, maybe at the last five or four years of their lives. Uh, of people's lives. So if you can extend health span and have people live long and healthy lives, it could not just, of course, benefit human beings, human society, but also uh, could really bring down healthcare costs uh, in many of our countries. So 
So what, when you have such a complicated phenomenon, what do scientists want to do? We essentially want to understand this program. So if, if I told you that this whole process is a program and we want to understand how nutrients are sensed, how IGF-1 works, how these things happen, as scientists, we immediately think about finding the parts list. We really try to find out, huh, really, as, it, uh, as I've drawn here, the nuts and the bowls of it. Really trying to find out what are these sensors, who's sensing things, who's sending a signal here and there, so that if we understand the circuitry, we can eventually really map out this process of aging and, of course, intervene with uh, interventions at some point. So I'll just tell you two things now. This is a very broad field, but since we brought up this whole IGF-1 and insulin and nutrients and so on, I want to tell you a little bit about how diets and, uh, and how uh, nutrients in general are sensed and how they might affect the aging process. And the second part, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, let's go from there to our individual cells and try to learn how these young cells become old cells and what they might help in the aging process. Of course, all of these eventually have to translate into physiology and from baby to an old man, uh, we have to really understand how all of our aspects are, manif uh, are uh, controlled by these factors, but let's just look at these two factors today. So I love comic books as Amayan told you, and I love um, reading Tintin comics and so on. So this is my homage to that. So why I'm showing you something completely out of blue here, molecule from Rapa Nui, is just to illustrate for you that though I'm giving you this linear story of we learned this, then we do this, and then we do that, science is never like this. It's extremely serendipitous. People work on completely unrelated different fields and suddenly maybe they meet over a coffee or something and they exchange ideas and new interesting things happen. So I want to tell you about this interesting molecule from Rapa Nui that really gave a really boost to the aging biology field to really try to understand how these things work. So as many of you know, this uh, you've probably seen those big statues of uh, these big faces that are in these uh, Easter Islands. Uh, that's one of the islands called Rapa Nui. It's in the South Pacific. Uh, I think it's administered by Chile. Uh, it was rediscovered by you know, Dutch sailors uh, in 1772. But something interesting happened. There was a group from uh, an expedition from Canada in 1964 that went to this island uh, just to understand how things were. Uh, they were naturalists probably. But one of the interesting things scientists often do is they collect soil samples to see if they understand they can discover different organisms and try to understand more things about this environment. So based on this little soil sample, the, the real hero of the story is this man called Dr. Suren Segal. He's called the father of rapamycin. So what this, he did this remarkable amount of work in his life where at this company called IRS Pharmaceuticals, this man and his team, they went step by step and found many different compounds. And of those compounds, he identified a compound, which he named rapamycin. And it had very interesting anti-cancer and anti-fungal effects, and they put that away, right? And uh, of course, he had nothing to do with aging and all of that, but that's the interesting thing about science. You had these chemists who had found this interesting compound. Now, many years later, uh, people wanted to see why these amazing effects of this uh, compound, why is it anti-cancerous? What is it doing? One of the things many scientists found, uh, about four of them together actually in 1994, they found that just, we won't go into too many details, that this compound, it binds to two proteins and I want you to focus on this one protein called TOR and very imaginatively called target of rapamycin. And it's kind of interesting how you discover proteins by discovering molecules that bind to them first. So again, fast forward a little bit more, people studied this compound and tried to find out what they do in cells. What they found was that, um, what they found was that um, what this compound did was essentially it fooled cells into thinking that uh, the cells were starving. It's kind of interesting that it did that. So essentially, if you gave a cell, and this is the cartoon of a cell, you gave it all the food it wanted, it was happy, it was growing, and everything was fine. But you gave this compound rapamycin, and suddenly, even though there was all this food around, the cell thought it was starving. So it is a very interesting finding that what you had done was you had found a signal that convinced the cells that it was starving. And it actually found the nutrient sensor that without this protein, the cells had a difficult time 
finding out how much nutrients they had to grow. Now, of course, this is a huge field. I'm not going to go into it. Here's a scientist with a question mark on his head. But essentially, what you have are these um, huge networks of proteins that bind to one another, affect many different processes. So we won't go into that. But let's just change, jump from here to seeing now that you have a compound that can modulate how cells sense nutrients, what does it do to aging? Maybe not surprisingly, but quite amazingly, treating these worms, the C. elegans worms that I told you, just feeding them rapamycin improved their lifespan by 20%. People are studying dogs. People uh, have fed these, this compound to mice and shown that it, even if you feed these mice uh, at middle age, it can increase their lifespan by more than 60%, which is quite amazing. Now, of course, uh, some of these studies are being done in humans, but immediately there's a caveat, right? This is a very important protein that's required in all cells. Uh, and you can't just go willy-nilly and uh, inhibit uh, TOR. But that said, what we have is a very interesting chemical probe that can go and fool the cells into think that they're starving. Now, going from starving, I just drew this cartoon of uh, this yogi over here. One of the natural ways of inhibiting mTOR, like rapamycin, is actually uh, caloric restriction by going on star starvation and so on, which many of these yogis often do. So it's fascinating now that we are coming to this circuitry that senses nutrients. And then what you have is uh, that no, starvation and fasting affects the same circuitry. So now that tells you that maybe there is something lifespan extending, health span extending about caloric restriction. So these are really new results uh, that just came out a couple of years ago. People take the lemur uh, monkeys and fed them just 30% lesser than what they usually eat. And what you can see from this graph is that their lifespan increased from six to nine years. And uh, people have actually seen amazing results with mice where giving them instead of their normal uh, 85 or 100 kilocalories per week, giving them about 40 to 50 kilocalories per week also amazingly extends lifespan very significantly from about 35 months to 60 months. So that really telling us that nutrients and how they are sensed and how they're metabolized is really hitting on a fundamental circuitry that regulates lifespan. So there's thousands of labs, probably hundreds of labs at least, who are really trying to understand all the signals that are involved. We already talked about TOR, there's insulin signaling, there's some amazing uh, signaling pathways, which I'm not going to go into, but just one thing I wanted to point to, which my laboratory is really interested in, is these ketone bodies. When you starve, you increase the level of these ketone bodies in your blood. And what are ketone bodies? Essentially, if you're starving, you're telling your body to mobilize fat. And what do fats do? They go to the liver, they get metabolized, and they release these interesting compounds called ketone bodies, which actually smell sweet. If somebody's been on a starvation diet for a long time, you can actually smell these uh, on them. They are, uh, they are ketones. And essentially, what these ketones do is now, since you don't have your normal uh, sh sugars and so on for uh, energy, they become the source of energy for your peripheral organs like muscle, for brain, and so on. And uh, that there's a real interest in trying to understand how these ketone bodies uh, regulate uh, lifespan. And there are actually a number of companies who are thinking about, in many ways, modulating the pathways and levels of ketone bodies as a way of mimicking caloric restriction. But let me just introduce you to one final, uh, one more concept that you know, it is not just all about food, how much we eat and all of that. There is a whole different aspect to nutrition, which actually is the circadian rhythm. And uh, here's a cartoon of Michael Rosbash. He was here at NCPS in Bangalore a few months ago. He won the Nobel Prize for really finding the molecular pathways that tune this clock. But in this very simplified cartoon, you can tell that your eyes see, perceive sunlight and unfortunately also light from phones and iPads and so on, which most of us are exposed to uh, for way too many hours during the day, including myself. Um, and they essentially set this, they essentially set this uh, clock, the central clock, it's called the SCN, the super chiasmatic nucleus. And what the central clock does, is tells you what time of the day or what time of the night it is. And essentially what it does is it regulates the behavior of your peripheral tissues and each of them have their own little clocks and it kind of sets what this one clock to another. So there is a, a very uh, deep in interaction between nutrients and between 
uh, the clocks. And one thing I just wanted to show you is that our metabolism and our physiology is not uh, static during the day. It actually changes a lot. And uh, I just wanted to show you this, this little cartoon uh, to illustrate that. During the day, you have a very different type of metabolism. You're making a lot of insulin, you're making fat, you're, meta you're meta metabolizing glucose and all of that. And this is the wake feeding cycle. And during the day, uh, during the night while you're sleeping, the metabolism actually becomes the opposite. Instead of a glucose mediated metabolism, you undergo mitochondrial metabolism. You are actually breaking down your fat. Instead of secreting insulin, your pancreas is secreting, secreting glucagon. So it's fascinating that even during the time of day, there is a huge change in our physiology. You can tell there's the highest blood pressure during the evening. There is a rise in blood pressure in the morning. Uh, quite morbidly, this uh, apparently in the morning is one of the highest probabilities of death, probably because there's a huge surge in blood pressure that's increasing as you wake up, uh, and so on. So, uh, of course, there is the you have the best cardiovascular muscle strength during the day. You have increased cholesterol synthesis at night. So it's very important for us to take a look at how physiology changes during the day and really try to understand how we can interface nutrition with circadian rhythms in the, in the process of aging. And I'll show you this one fascinating experiment that Professor Sachin Panda just did a few years ago, and he's been publishing routinely on it, and this really changed how I live my life. Essentially, what he did was he showed you that it wasn't about how many calories you ate or for regulating your lifespan or what kind of calories you ate. It was more, more about what times you ate those. So this fascinating experiment that uh, Dr. Panda did was he took these normal cute mice and he fed them he, for 24 hours. He said, eat all you want, ice cream and Modux and all of that. And uh, as you would expect, a normal mouse would uh, get obese and it lived not a very long life. But then he made one simple change. He said, you can eat all of this stuff, but you can only eat it for nine hours during the day. The rest of the time, you don't get any food. And it, the point I want you to note is that both of these mice ate the same number of calories. They ate the same amount, interestingly enough. But one mouse did not gain any weight and lived much longer than a mouse that uh, was just allowed to eat the same number of calories throughout the day. And he also did that with an obese mouse and gave it all the food it wanted. But as long as he restricted the mouse's diet, same number of calories for nine hours, mice lost weight and they lived longer. Now this again tells you something amazing that it is not just about calories, but also about when, how you time that with your circadian rhythm that governs how uh, long you live or the kind of health span, because I'm not showing you the health span data, but these mice that ate only for a short period of time also had very, uh, very healthy lives in terms of uh, the amount of fat that they accumulated in terms of fibrosis in the lung, et cetera. So what I've told you so far is that um, what you're seeing here is like this very interesting interface between circadian rhythms and diet. Uh, in terms of modulating how the aging process works. I want you to leave you with one final couple of things that when you grow old now, what is growing old? Your cells are growing old. And I really want you to realize that my laboratory works on skeletal muscle. We all lose skeletal muscle mass as we get older. The stem cells associated with these tissues are involved in repair and regeneration. They also go down in number, but more importantly, all of our tissues start accumulating senescent cells. So what's, this is a very new and very interesting concept in biology right now in terms of intervening in this process. So we all know that uh, cells age as we age, and I'm not going to go into many theories of aging. Of course, it has to do with uh, nutrition. Many of you would have heard of the Ross hypothesis reactive oxygen species that damage DNA. Then there is uh, something we won't go into, which is the telomeres, which uh, at the end of our chromosomes which was discovered by Elizabeth Blackburn. Uh, many of these dysfunctions do happen in terms of levels of the, your telomeres, the levels of your mitochondrial metabolism. Uh, and they all probably in some way lead to cellular aging. But I want to leave you with one very optimistic, amazing thing that's happening in aging biology. This is one of my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Judith Campisi. What Judy found was that these cells that accumulate with aging aren't just sitting there as old cells. They're actually secreting a number of factors. And these factors that are being secreted by these senescent cells are actually promoting cancer. They promote inflammation. And there's a fascinating hypothesis that the accumulation of these old senescent cells might actually be
controlling the fundamental process of aging, which again begs the simple question, okay, if I have old cells in my body as I'm getting older, if I kill them, would you live long? Would you at least uh, decelerate some of the aspects, uh, harmful aspects of aging? These are very new experiments, just happened over the past few years now. Uh, before I tell you what happens in those results, as you can see, I just want you to know that it's not these senescent cells actually also perform a function. Uh, they aren't all bad. They actually have a positive effect. If they're present acutely for short periods of time, they're important for wound healing and so on. But if they're present for a long amount of time in your body as you age, they cause cancer, inflammation, arthritis, and so on. So there's a huge excitement at this point in the aging area of trying to find drugs. They are called senolytic drugs that will specifically kill the old cells. There are the specific suicide inhibitor drugs which we can go into that also kill these old cells. Recently, I'm glad um, Alok just brought up uh, the CAR T cells. CAR T cells can be targeted to other cells as well. There was a study just a few weeks ago where they engineered a CAR T cell that could actually go recognize the old senescent cells and kill them. And the again, these are very early days and only been done in mice so far, but the results are really promising that if you have these mice and they have these old cells accumulating, they get old and they have short uh, their normal lifespans. Recently now they have been starting to, uh, they have started treating these uh, mice with uh, these drugs. And what you're finding is that killing these old cells in these mice is actually prolonging lifespan and increasing health span by as much as 17 to 42% and increasing the health span in terms of improving liver fibrosis and lung fibrosis. Some of this work is in collaboration with my lab as well. So in the end, this is my last slide. I just wanted to summarize what you just learned that we just told that, uh, I just mentioned that there's this huge interface between the kind of calories that you consume, the type of calories that you consume, ketone bodies, store signaling, insulin signaling, and how they interface with uh, the uh, circadian rhythms and how they regulate aging. And more importantly, that as we age, one of the things that happens in most tissues, differentially in some tissues more than others, is that you accumulate these old cells and elimination of these old cells can in fact has the potential to increase our health span and rejuvenation in the future. And that's where I think the biology of aging is going. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. I think that was really fascinating, especially with the comics. I mean, it really brings a whole other dimension to understanding science. And I'm, I think all of your illustrations were really interesting to look at as well. Good. Uh, so we have a bunch of questions. Yeah. So um, someone is asking about whether you feed fish less because uh, you want to increase their lifespan. Would that be accurate? You know, the, the, the caloric restriction, feeding less seems to be highly conserved. I showed you it works in worms. It shows it works in even humans, I believe. So, um, I don't know why they don't feed fish very much, but it would be certainly a fascinating model system, if you want to call it that, to see if in fact that is true, but I don't know. Okay, uh, great. So I guess that question is done. And um, so if um, you increase the energy supply of a cell, can it affect aging? Uh, it definitely can. Um, so the point I want to emphasize is that it's not just energy supply, but the type of energy that you're supplying. So we certainly know that if you supply the same amount of energy and you, you know, drink a lot of Coke and sweets and so on, you're supplying energy, but this is a different type of energy. Glucose has other bad effects on you. Uh, but instead, if you supply the same energy in certain aspects, either via ketone bodies or in some cases through lipid oxidation, then uh, you can definitely put away some of the negative effects. But yes, I think how you, how you regulate your energy metabolism, how efficiently you regulate it, certainly regulates aging. Okay, great. Uh, so then there are a few questions on, um, uh, sorry, uh, can you put some uh, on oxidative stress and antioxidants? Um, that this, this theory of oxidative stress and aging has been around for a while. And uh, the answer is, as with life, a lot more complicated. Um, oxidative stress in some in small doses is actually important. Uh, cells need it to signal. Uh, they actually need it to kill pathogens like bacteria, macrophages. Uh, your immune cells require it. So 
yes, everything in life, in, in aging is about homeostasis, about balance. Um, so yes, if you have excess amounts of reactive oxygen species, you can accelerate aging, no doubt. Uh, and as far as antioxidants go, um, it's just not been able to find a good antioxidant that can uh, enter cells that can actually perform as a really good drug so far. But uh, people have tried antioxidants and in my experience, it's always been a bit disappointing. Uh, they haven't worked amazingly yet. Okay, I see. Uh, so uh, someone is asking on YouTube, um, does respiration or your metabolism determine your lifespan? That is a great question. People have actually, uh, there are some theoretical biologists who have calculated your respiratory rate and uh, Um, uh, hello, sorry, I lost you there. Yes. Sorry. No, I lost yes. It there. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, so we were speaking about um, the metabolism rate. How does it affect? Ah, that's us? right. That's right. I think it is uh, just like with weight that I plotted. Um, I plotted the respiratory rate and I plotted lifespan. So I do think there is a correlation. Uh, I do think there is a correlation, uh, but I don't know if it is causative yet. But there is a correlation between respiratory rate and lifespan. Right. Uh, and uh, okay, so then moving on, um, someone has raised their hand. So I'm just going to ask um, Adve to go ahead and ask your question. Um, okay, uh, Adve lowered their hand. Um, Malati um, has asked a question uh, or has a question to ask. Uh, Chandu, can you please unmute? Yeah. Uh, Malati, you can. Uh... Uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Malati? Um, okay, maybe we'll come back to that. Sure. So for right now, we'll go back to the questions that have been asked here. Um, so one is uh, during uh, starvation, autophagy is uh, activated. So does that control aging? And um, the person has also asked, do quiescent cells undergo aging? That Those are great questions. Obviously, really good scientists out there. Uh, yes, autophagy does control aging. And you're right. One of the uh, so we just talked about the phenomenon of starvation. And as I was mentioning, there's a huge amount of interest in understanding what are the downstream effects of starvation? How are the which are the actual processes that mediate this effect. And autophagy is certainly one of them and autophagy controls aging. And uh, the other question was about quiescent cells. Great question. Um, quiescent cells, for those who don't know this word, quiescent means uh, asleep. Um, many of the cells in our body, especially stem cells, are held in a, in a, are kept at sleep to be able to wake up when necessary, when you need to repair your tissue. Quiescent cells are kept asleep because they are so precious. Uh, they are not uh, metabolizing. They are not changing very much. So that's a great question. I don't know anyone who has actually um, looked at the aging phenotype of quiescent cells. So I don't know if quiescent cells themselves age, probably not. But we certainly know that the aging environment affects quiescent cells. So if you take the same quiescent cell from a young person and put it into an old person, the quiescent cell will not behave the same way because the milieu, the environment of an aged person is different and that influences how quiescent cells behave. Hope that answers the question. Okay, great. I think that does. Um, someone is uh, curious about how old cells are removed from the body. That's also a great question. Uh, let's just say this is only a few years old, right? This is uh, at the cutting edge of aging biology. So in order to understand how to remove it, you need to understand what makes old cells old. Um, so number of scientists have gone 
to look for enzymes that are expressed only in old cells and not in young cells. So the way scientists often go about is they try to find for, look for markers, proteins, things that are expressed in old cells and they go to try to block that. And right now there's a couple of compounds in the clinic. Um, one of them, it just so happens that these cells are very reticent to dying. It's called BCL2 is the protein. And uh, there are some inhibitors of some of these pathways that es essentially move the cells towards death. Uh, there's also another couple of, I mean, we can talk about this for hours, but there's a couple of clever strategies to inhibit enzymes that are expressed only in old cells with drugs. And then I told you the last one was very recently the CAR-T. If you can use CAR-T cells to kill cancer cells, and if you find markers uh, of old cells, you can use CAR-T cells to kill old cells. And Scott Lowe at uh, Sloan Kettering just published that just maybe two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so someone is also asking about, you know, some of the ways that um, other diseases that are correlated with, uh, you know, the concept of early aging, kind of like cancer and obesity and other diseases. Is that something you can comment on? Yes, like I said, the graph that I showed you is compelling in that, you know, so uh, there are things that I believe which aren't necessarily true, which aren't necessarily true for other scientists. But the thought is that we have been treating cancer and diabetes and obesity and neurological diseases as different diseases. What we're trying to come to is a more common mechanism and one of the contributing mechanisms is that your aging body itself drives these diseases. What you see as different diseases might actually have a fundamental underlying mechanism. Uh, so yes, we should treat uh, different diseases, but the hope is that if fundamental things like uh, the accumulation of these old cells, now there's actually some uh, companies out there, if you can search on Google, who actually uh, show that getting rid of old cells can actually ameliorate arthritis in certain uh, cases, uh, can ameliorate obesity in, uh, uh, in, at least in mouse models. So uh, I think that there are some fundamental uh, mechanisms in aging which could be targeted for all neurological diseases and all uh, metabolic disease possibly. Okay, great. I, uh, we have a lot of questions about things that can be done to sort of change your aging mm. process mm. so one of them is about exercise um you know mm. yeah. would athletes live longer than a normal human being who doesn't who's not very active for instance again uh the the, the uh what i want to emphasize is health span over lifespan uh there is no evidence whatsoever that somebody who exercises uh, on an average in mice and humans lives longer but what you can definitely know is they'll live healthier for a much longer time. Uh, exercise is amazing. If there is one thing that certainly has anti-aging effects on all kinds of tissues, not just muscle, but actually on memory, on regeneration and different tissues, it is exercise and I certainly recommend it. Okay, great. Uh, maybe we can go to a couple of um, um, more technical questions. Yeah. So someone is asking um, about uh, whether uh, gut microbes control aging? Great question. This is all at the forefront of uh, aging biology. Uh, and uh, I think there might have been a bliss talk a uh, little while ago, but for many of the people listening, we have more uh, microbes in the gut than our own cells, I believe. And uh, they have a tremendous influence on our physiology. Um, I would be shocked if they did not have a positive effect on aging. Uh, and we certainly know that as you age, your gut micro microbiome does change. People have shown that. Um, I have not seen anybody transplant a young microbiome into an old microbiome to show any change in aging or lifespan yet. But I think, I'm sure these experiments are being done. But uh, microbiome does have a profound impact on aging. Great. Uh, so I guess that clears up quite a lot of the people's questions. We have a lot more. Um, maybe we'll just take one last one about um, something interesting. What is special about the immortal jellyfish which makes them immortal? Oh, that's a great question. I wish we knew. Um, actually, I'll tell you this. I'm not an expert on jellyfish biology by any means. And there's this amazing Japanese scientist, I forget his name, who spent his whole life studying these animals. But one thing I can tell you about them, it seems like all of these animals that are 
immortal for all practical purposes. Unlike us are constantly degenerating, right? We have these muscle tissues and these different tissues that stay the same. We can repair them, but they do get older. But the amazing thing about these jellyfish and other to the other organs like planarians and so on, are that their ability to regenerate and the ability to replenish old cells is, is uh, amazing and to the point where I think it's not even the same animal a few years later because it's constantly replacing and making its cell younger. So that's what we can learn, but I don't see how we can emulate that. Um, <clears throat> great, thank you so much, Arvind. I think this has been very, very enlightening for all of us about you know what aging really means in in the biology terms that's right and um mine would you like to add anything no nothing for me okay then i'll just say thank you so much arvind and thank you thank to you. everyone thank you for there. joining everybody yeah thanks uh, arvind bye we still have thanks. a lot of questions remaining but we will let you go for now thanks <laughs> okay good and a uh, shout out to saravana for uh, managing everything from uh, the instem center of cmc vellore uh, so thank you for that and um, this has been very interesting i'll be closing the call now <laughs>